Hey guys, Michael here again. Today we're going to talk about documentaries, science education, and the kind of reality television gimmicks that have kind of invaded that. So when I was a kid, there was this gentleman named Carl Sagan, and he did a series called Cosmos. This was a big deal. Um, Prior to that, I mean, you had educational television, you know, you had PBS stuff, Jacques Cousteau, you know, you had uh, Wild Kingdom, things like that. But the really big ideas, the stuff that's hard to wrap your head around because the world doesn't operate the way you think it does at the very large and the very small, to have somebody like Carl Sagan take such complex topics as... Uh, the way stars are formed, the way that, that matter accretes and fusion creates heavier elements, you know, metals and stars, uh, to describe quantum physics in the very small, uh, where the rules of the world change, to describe the speed of light and, and the weirdness that it would be to travel at the speed of light, where everything, you know, is very blue shifted, you know, and to describe these very difficult to intuit things, but in a way that a little kid like me could understand, the way that your parents could understand. And not just to explain it, but to give you a sense of wonder about it. You know, um, one of my favorite expressions is billions and billions. You know, thinking about billions and billions of stars. He took little Michael's curiosity at a tender young age and expanded it greatly and made me look around at the world and question and wonder about everything. It was wonderful. It's directly responsible for me being the man that I am today. Curious, you know, still very curious in spite of my middle age. I never stopped wanting to learn about the world. Um, I would literally be a very different person without guys like Carl Sagan, without that type of educational programming and documentary television. Somewhere along the way, we went from wonder of the universe and here's these very complex, amazing things that, that are absolutely true and here's how we know that they're true. We've gone from that to kind of a reality television type of shtick where you're using fear to incite people to watch your show. And I'll give you an example. Um, I did this in the intro. You know. The massive caldera in Yellowstone and how it can kill you. Coming up next on the Discovery Channel. You know, and then they show all the different ways that if that super volcano went off, that it would kill everything and everyone. It would ruin America. It would put the world in an ice age. You know, and they have the scary music. Bum, 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 You know, and they're really like trying to drive up this fear factor. And yeah, a volcano, especially a massive super volcano going off, that would be a very scary thing. But isn't it more amazing to think that we are floating on a little, little skim, the little crust on a molten ball of, <laughs> of iron with the nuclear furnace, you know, the size of a planet. And we exist basically on the skin of this molten ball of, of fire and metal and radioactive decay. We exist on that skin under a, a little bit of atmosphere that, that is thinner than a sheet of paper. Like if you were to, you know, compare the size of the earth to how relatively thin our atmosphere is, we basically exist on this teeny tiny little sliver on the surface of this planet underneath this, this little sliver of atmosphere. The entire rest of it, the, if you go too high, you die. You go too low, you die. Like, life is precious, and it is amazing to think that, that all of our human history has occurred on this little skin, on this nuclear orange that's the Earth, you know? But they don't talk about that. They talk about all the different ways that it can kill you. Um, Shark Week. Okay. Yeah, sharks are very cool, very interesting. One of the things that, that I find interesting about sharks is I, when I'm rating how dangerous something is, I do what I call the lion test. Here's the lion test. If you walked into an enclosure full of lions, would you be walking back out? 
probably not. Even if they were just fed, if they were wild lions, um, they're going to do what lions do and you're going to die. <laughs> they're going to remind you you're made of meat. Yet, people can swim around in groups of sharks and not be attacked. You can reasonably expect to be surrounded by sharks and to make it home in time for dinner if you don't trigger them. But it's very hard to not trigger a lion. Just simply having a pulse and, and being alive is enough to trigger a lion to, to eat you. Not for a shark, though. Um, so sharks are scary, but they're not like lion going to eat you scary, you know? And yet, that coldness to them, their, their unblinking, beady, doll-like eyes, eyes that only come alive when they bite, you know, that kind of stuff. That's what freaks people out and makes people watch Shark Week. But the Discovery Channel, rather than showing how interesting and fascinating sharks are, um, they, they do do that to an extent, but they also try to scare the living crap out of you about sharks. And they show sharks, you know, shaking the, the diving cage and, and trying to get at the divers inside because they've put chum all over the water. Um, and they're trying to whip these sharks up into a frenzy so they can get something to show on their, their television show. But in general, our science education, and, and once, once, at, once you start looking for this, now that I have, have opened your eyes to this, I want you to look for it. The next time you watch Discovery Channel or, or you know, the, the History Channel or something like that, I want you to listen to the music first of all, because documentary should not really have a soundtrack like a movie, right? They shouldn't have music that's playing to try to, to force a mood or an emotion on you. That's, that works well in cinema. That's what movies are for. They're trying to make you feel things. A documentary shouldn't be trying to emotionally manipulate you like that though. So first thing is listen for the music. If you hear the bum 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 bum, you know, if you hear the the dark, you know, the dissonant, the the minor key, you know, if you're hearing the soundtrack to Lord of the Rings or something like that, you already know that that there's a little bit more going on in that that science show, that documentary than they want you to really think about. And it's not like they're some huge trick. I mean, they're not trying to pull one over on you. What they're trying to do is to make television that people want to watch. But the way that they're doing that is by using the same tricks that soap operas, that, that dramas, that reality television, they're using those same tactics to try to get people to watch these shows. And it, it lessens it. How are you going to get a sense of wonder the same way that you did watching Carl Sagan's Cosmos. How are you going to get that sense of wonder when you're basically watching Judge Judy but with a lab coat on? You're not. Um, and in fact, if you're a young, impressionable child like I was, you might get fear. You might become afraid of volcanoes rather than, than understanding them and, and some of that fear abating because now you know how they work and, and what a volcanian eruption actually is like, and that they're not all volcanian eruptions. You've got Stromboli-type eruptions. You have these, these different ways that volcanism happens, and not all of them are Mount St. Helens, right? You won't learn that stuff, and so you might actually get a fear of volcanoes. You might get a fear of, of all the different things that can kill us. Now, the world absolutely can kill us. Oh my God, we are so amazingly lucky that we even exist to ask these questions. And the fact that I've lived my life, you know, without, you know, starving to death or, or dying of famine or disease or, or natural disaster, I consider myself very lucky. But that's not necessarily what you want to teach people when you're trying to teach them about science and about exercising logic and reason um, and being curious about the world. I don't think fear and curiosity go very well together. Now, another place that you see these same type of tactics are in like broadcast news. And there was a time when news was more like newspaper news. Uh, and when I say newspaper news, I mean, you have a reporter and they are relating facts. They're saying, this person said this, um, here's what the police say happened. Um, they're not doing an editorial. An editorial is where somebody, the, the person writing the article is giving you their opinion on things. 
A newspaper article should not have an opinion. It should be stating facts and allow the reader to develop their own opinion. Uh, news used to be like this. Uh, a car was stolen and the perpetrator was caught by the police later that afternoon. That's what a news story used to be like. Somewhere around the time of the late 70s, somebody hit upon the fact that when you give people bad news, when you tell them about murders and rapes and, and all the horrible things out there, that people will watch the news longer. Now, these news programs get their financing through advertising. So, in order for them to make more money, they figured out that if they play more sensational news, um, if they try to scare people into watching the news, that people will watch longer, they get more viewership, and they can make more money. And that kind of started the 24-hour news cycle. Um, and it, it, <laughs> I encourage you to go and look at any kind of broadcast, you know, recorded news reports back in the 60s, then compare them to the 70s, then compare them to the 80s, where things really started to get weird. And you're going to find that sensationalism and what we used to call yellow journalism um, are, are rampantly going up. Um, people really don't know the difference between an editorial and a news story anymore. And they don't differentiate watching a talking head like newscast, you know, on CNN or Fox News or whatever, where you have these people all talking about something that happened. They don't really think about the fact that that's not news. That's not reporting, I should say. They're not reporting about facts. Now, most of that news cycle is people talking about what happened and relaying their opinions about these things. And those opinions usually drive up fear, which again, drives up viewership, which gets more money for the news outlet. But the point is that their financial model relies upon scaring the shit out of the people watching these news shows. And it worked for the news shows, and it's definitely working for documentaries, science, technology, engineering, uh, television. And it's ruining curiosity. It's scaring kids. It is absolutely ruining this, this wonder, this experience of, of learning how the world works, of, of trying to figure it all out. You know, this should be something that, that makes you excited and, and want to learn more about it. It's something that should motivate you to actually go out and learn more on your own, you know? Um, the process of learning, when you're a curious person, it never stops. It's not like you graduate school and you're like, all right, I guess I'm done reading textbooks. No, you still wonder about things like, oh, I heard the tomato plant is related to the tobacco plant. How is that so? And you go and you read about it and you, you try to learn and these little puzzle pieces fit into your head and you start to develop a like a model of, of how the world actually works. Like you start to think about things like if it wasn't for gravity, <laughs> the world would be full of uh, hydrogen and a little bit of helium. You know, we wouldn't have carbon and oxygen and sulfur and all these heavier elements, like we're literally walking, talking star stuff, and that is that is mind-blowing stuff. But when you watch Discovery Channel documentaries about suns and stars and planetary formation, all they're talking about are gamma ray bursts from, from distant, you know, black holes, and, and if they're aimed right at our solar system, they're going to fry us like fish in a frying pan. And they talk about comets and what a cometary impact would be like and, and how it would destroy the Earth. And hey, here's asteroids. And guess what? Asteroids can kill you. And hey, here's a time that another small planet the size of Mars smashed into Earth and destroyed all, all life on Earth. And like literally the shtick is that every one of these episodes of like The Universe, and this is an actual documentary called The Universe. You can go Google it. Like every single episode tells you how something that they're talking about could kill you. They're talking about asteroids, they talk about asteroid impacts. They're talking about comets, they talk about cometary impacts. They're talking about the sun and the fact that it's going to become you know, a red giant one day. They're going to tell you that the sun's going to destroy the earth, it's going to engulf it. And, and this is true, but that's not the really interesting thing about it, right? And, and again, it's how they're relaying this information with the dramatic music and, you know, 
showing that literally they might as well have like a little earth on a string and like a lighter or a blowtorch like this is the earth <laughs> you know that that's the kind of thing that they're doing you know, if they talk about black holes they talk about how a black hole could destroy all life on earth you know if they're talking about you know the the, the local group if they're talking about other galaxies like the fact that the andromeda galaxy is someday going to collide with the milky way galaxy they're telling you all the ways that's going to screw everything up and I disagree with that. I really do. Uh, we shouldn't be trying to scare people with knowledge. The world's a scary enough place without dramatic music and reality show theatrics. You know what I'm saying? What I would like to see is shows like The New Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Hey, Neil. <laughs> like he's ever going to see this. Um, you know, again, where they're they're trying to show the wonder of the universe. They're trying to show the wonderful things that are out there and make us realize how amazing and, and lucky and, and rare it is for, for us to even be here to talk about these things. You know, you, you think about the fact that because gravity is, is just strong enough to cause matter to collapse in on itself and that if enough of it collapses back in on itself, um, it gets hot enough and dense enough that some of that matter gets squeezed together and it forms new kinds of matter, heavier elements, you know, the, the metals, and that those things can propagate across the universe and then they can cool down and this, this ash, basically, this, this nuclear solar ash can collect and form planets and those planets can sometimes have life on them and that that life can somehow survive long enough and, and learn enough to, to know itself and that life can then look up and start figuring out how the universe works, how stars work, how matter was created, that you should have this entire universe. Like we're literally like <laughs> we're living on the skin of a nuclear orange, you know, under the a paper thin wafer of, of atmosphere floating on a speck of dust amongst billions and billions and billions of stars. How unlikely should it be that we should be here at all? How amazing is it that, that we ended up where we're at? That we should be alive and be conscious and have the ability to even learn and understand. That is amazing. That is absolutely amazing that, that we have the capacity to understand the universe. That is one of the greatest gifts that, that we could ever ask for. And we shouldn't use fear to try to get people to watch shows about these things. It, it's, it's not in the spirit of, of learning and curiosity. I hope you guys stay curious. That's all I've got. Thank you for watching my video.